Hello, everyone. It's great to see you. I'm glad that uh, you've gotten to join me here today for our free Q&A Wednesday online workshop here for Joel. And I'm really glad that uh, you've taken the time to do this. You might be squeezing away from work a little early, or it might be the end of your workday if you're retired. So I'm glad that uh, you can uh, join me. We'll cover any topic you want to. I have about three main topics I want to cover in our time together today. Uh, so uh, you can uh, ask any question you like, though. You can unmute yourself. If you have trouble unmuting yourself at all, let me know. If you're speaking to me, I'm going to assume you found a way to unmute yourself. So uh, that should be pretty fun today. So there, like I said, there are three main topics I want to cover. And the first one will be about this. Uh, I'll mention this live golf thing real briefly. What I, what I found is that uh, this is almost like a moral issue with a lot of people. And I can understand where folks are coming from on that. Um, but also, I would say that, uh, you know, there's some basic business things we can talk about there and some basic entertainment and athletic things we can talk about, too. And then another topic I want to touch on today is the fact that this weekend, the men tour players and the lady tour players are playing together down in Naples. And so that'll be a fun one to watch. Um, 20 teams, I think it is, a total of 40 players are playing. A man is paired with a woman. And so that should be pretty fun to watch. And you can learn a lot from that. And I have an interesting story to tell you that happened in 1961 about the men tour players playing with the lady tour players. So I look forward about that. And you can ask me questions about that as we go today as well. And then the other thing I wanted to, the other, th the third topic I want to touch on is that uh, you can really improve your game a lot if you hang with me a pretty good amount. And if you're really smart, you can improve your game even more because you're the one who hits the shots. The way I looked at it, the way I look at things, I'm just a facilitator. So we'll talk about how you can really improve your game quite a bit if you're hanging with me and I will show you numbers uh, from people's games who have improved, as I would say, let me see, one player improved 72%, the other one improved 50%. The one improved 72% over the course of four seasons, and the other one improved 50% this season alone. So I look forward to talking about that. So if you have questions right now, I'd love to hear them, especially if you live in New Hampshire. If you live in New Hampshire, I would really like to hear questions from anybody. I'm giving preferential treatment to people who live in New Hampshire today uh, because I find them, they're nice people all over America, but especially in New Hampshire, I've found. So I would love to hear your questions if you have any coming from New Hampshire. <laughs> Not to put the finger on anybody or point anybody out. So the first topic, like I said, I wanted to cover is this, uh, the live golf thing. Um, what I've observed, I'm, as most of you know, I'm, uh, I'm old enough to have done grown through my hair. So, uh, can you hear me? I hear uh, a gentleman coming in from New Hampshire. So, hey, uh, I don't I mind. I finally figured out how to thing. unmute my microphone. <laughs> well, your microphone's working because apparently, because I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so I do have a question. I don't know that it's on the topic you're going to cover today, but I saw something about um i didn't quite understand the article but it was about if you can just touch on it today sure. about something about the golf balls it's like there seems to be some kind of weird thing about how the golf balls are um rolling back maybe they're trying to make them more lively or they're trying to make them less lively less i don't lively. know what it is yeah less lively less so am I, if that's the case am i still going to be able to use all the pro v ones i have <laughs> <laughs> well uh is it, see again, what i mean in other words would i be playing with an illegal golf ball that that's a perfectly good question of a law-abiding citizen um which i know people in new hampshire are so uh i think there i know of one tour player 
that lives in New Hampshire, and I'm and I think his name is Keegan Bradley, either Vermont or New Hampshire. I, I know you always get them mixed up. I'm sorry, or the rest of us get them mixed up. But um, so I'm I'm assuming that this is not. Well, I know for a fact it's this question is not coming from the one PGA Tour player that lives in New Hampshire. So, um, so since you're not going to have PGA Tour officials following you. As you attempt to play the Pro V1s you have bought recently, I think while in your conscience you may have some guilt, you know, that could be there, but I want you to realize, I want to calm your guilt and say that since you're not playing in a PJ Tour event, you are not actually doing anything wrong. Okay. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Well, but, I mean, it just seems like it's like, I don't want to say changing the rules in the middle of the game, but it's like, right. come on, we just spent we just spent fifty dollars a box, right. and you're telling me I can't use these things? Right. Like, are you kidding me? Be because you didn't spend twenty three dollars a box to get right. these that that I would have encouraged you to get. So, so yeah, so you can still use them absolutely as long as you don't play in a tour event. Now, if you play in a PJ tour event, you know they might get a little testy on you. But the headline I saw this actual morning was that. Um, that they are actually not going to do that to the tour until maybe 2028. So some yeah, of them are yeah. dead by then. And, and I, I, I see where they're coming from only because um, the I like one of the subscribers to my newsletter is a course designer. He owns Ben Crenshaw Golf. And here, people like Bryson DeChambeau and some of these other guys are crushing a ball 300 flipping yards. Like, you know, it's like they, if they build the courses big, they're only going to be building them bigger for the pros. And we can't do it. Like, I I mean, how do they expect somebody like me, a 71 year old guy to hit a par on a par four, 425 yard hole? Like, are you kidding me? You know, come on. <laughs> yep. So that's a very good question. And again, the, the good news is, again, it looks like they're not going to do it till 2028, according to the one headline I saw. I didn't read the article. I admit it was just the headline I saw. Um, and the PGA of America, I actually got an email this morning from our illustrious uh, CEO and president, and they told me that the PGA believes they should not roll back the ball. So I was glad to hear that, you know, since I'm a PGA member, so they told me what to believe. So, right. so anyway, that's that's another topic that obviously All right. okay. that's that's with me. Enough of that. But, yeah. but the enough, PGA yeah, right. of America, I, which is us you know, little schmuck club pros like myself. Uh, we're not the big fancy PJ tour guys on TV that you see. We right. believe, and I was told this this morning in an email, uh, that we believe they should not roll back the ball. Okay. So, so it's still kind of amongst the muckety mucks, the powers that be, and those two guys who sent me an email this morning personally. Um, they're saying, you know, we still have some doubts about this. It's not a done deal yet. All right, so I, can I, I have another question. I'd yes, like sir, to, you're allowed. Um, you're going to love this one because you and I had the luxury of playing with you last year, if you remember. And while we were out on the course, um, you're trying, we're trying to play and you're trying to teach at the same time, which is a little, it can be a little tough, all right? It, it, for me, at least, at my end, I comprehend it. <clears throat> and you... Um, told me when I swung with an iron or or like a my pitching wedge right. that I need to like hit the ground and get under the ball. All right. So I oh. I've never done that. In other words, I've always like skimmed the grass. All right. It finally connected yesterday. It's oh like, good. And so so well here's I think I can help you explain it to somebody else. Okay. Good. Um, because because what happened was because maybe it's just me. Maybe it was me. Um, what happens was is I was watching a video yesterday of Bryson DeChambeau giving Rick Shields a lesson. All right. And so Rick Shields like the biggest. He's got the biggest golf channel on YouTube. And here he he um took it. He was there in a in a bunker and he took a, a club and he made a line in the bunker. Bryson did. And he's swinging, and he just wants the club not to hit behind the line, but to hit in the groove, under, you know, you know, because the groove's deeper than the sand. All right, so then it finally hit me. I get it, because if you hit it, if you're just skimming the grass, 
the 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 club face is not hitting dead center of the club face. Your right. the club is higher than the center of the ball. So right. it's like which is which is why all of a sudden it connected like well of course every time I see a pro tour pro take a shot that they're they're making a small divot in the grass because that that's what you're supposed I've never done that so now I think after yesterday my iron shots are going to be a lot better so good 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 to hear the uh, again I'm glad you learned it it sounds like you learned it pretty well yesterday. But I will say to you, your whole uh, colloquy there started with, Joel, you told me last year to get under it. And I think the young kids call that a trigger. So that okay. I, never, I have never, ever, ever, ever told anybody <laughs> to hit under it, to get under it. I have found that preposition to be bad, 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 bad. Not okay. good. Not gonna do it. Not gonna do it. <laughs> Not good. It's down through. Down through. Right. The, okay. The right. Two right. prepositions that I have been using for about thirty-five years. Down through. I've never. Almost everybody says a little bit what you said there. I'm trying to get under it, and I say that is the problem. Going back to fifth grade English class here. Wrong preposition. You do not want to get under the ball. All right, that is the wrong preposition. All the good players, like you've learned yesterday, go down through it. And quite often what I will do is I'll put three or four T's in a line or three or four leaves in a line this time of the year in the fall. Or, yeah, if we're in a bunker, I'll draw a line in uh, two ball markers, anything, to create a line, put the ball on that line, and then people hit after the student hits, we see if there's a divot. If there's no divot, that's a problem. That means they didn't hit any earth. If we see the divot behind the line, we say, no, that's because you're probably trying to get under it. You're trying to get lower than the ball and get under it. So that way you hit it fat quite often because mentally you didn't understand the prepositions. You want to hit the ball first. All the good players do. I have a million videos I can show you over here where the ball gets hit first and then the divot happens in front of where the ball was sitting. And then after the ball and the divot fly, we look down at our line and we say, oh, yeah, sweet. I got the ball first and a little divot out front, just as you accurately described there. Right. Exactly. OK, bingo. Yeah, because then that way it's the it just what 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 I did not understand when you said it is that by doing it that way, it puts the 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 center sweet of the spot. ball in the center of the club face. Right. Exactly. That was the missing link for me. Right. Instead yes. of the club head. You're exactly right. Because if I just skim in the grass, you're going to hit it thin. Right. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. This is good. Thousand points of life. Right there. Thousand points exactly. of life. This oh. is no divot. Or if it exactly. was a divot, it was back behind the ball. Right. Right. This right there. That's thousand points of life. Bingo. There you go. Yeah. So um, perfect. Well, it made, uh, I mean, you know, so that's a, just another tip uh, that I, I think that I just wanted to share and wanted to clarify that. I, I love sure it. I Very good it. question. Yeah. Super good question. The um, now, Can I share uh, my screen? Yes, please do. Okay. I'm going to share my screen with y'all. And what I want you to see is what's going on with your swing. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, this is a certain student I know that I've known for a number of years, and I see him every so often, and it's always a fun time when I see him. But what I want to show you here about um, what you're seeing here is that... Sam, I'm very encouraged. Oops. Two main things I love today. So I'm going to see if we can stop the video. I've seen at the, sweet the, Especially on the pitches, important part here, what I say to my students is the old is gold and the new is blue. So what we see here on the left is good extension. All right. Now keep watching here. That's the kind of good extension that is a big part of what enables you to get that divot out front. Whereas over here on our right, what we see is bad extension. That's the old gold. 
Right, does that, right. Does that make sense? Yes. And over here on mm -hmm. our left is the good stuff. That kind of extension on our left is what we want in our swings. Look at this contrast. Look at that beautiful extension. That's a big part of what enables people to get the down through dynamic occurring. Right. Down and through, I, I mean, the arms are extended. Look, now if we look at the old goal, yeah, look at the, ex look yeah, at the old exactly. goal. Yeah. See the club head is going to be kind of leveling. It's not going to be getting down through because we're pulling it up with our arms. Right through. Right, the, right, right. Yeah, so look at the arms. Contrast. Yeah, the arms in the old goal are horrible. <laughs> that guy's a loser. <laughs> I know you're recording it. <laughs> so, so that's what that's one of the reasons I allowed you to go ahead and ask me those questions today about how to get down through. And 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 this is one of the big reasons I've enjoyed people enjoying my your golf right answers, my 16 video lessons through the winter. Quite often what I've found is many of you just don't intellectually understand these very simple dynamics and concepts and principles that are happening in your golf life. And so I gave, I sent y'all emails this week, all people who've been my students over the years and my current students to tell you, look, there's 16, 20 to 30 minute videos that you can do through the winter, anytime you want lifetime access to them to get these things clear in your mind. And again, as always, you can just like this on Wednesdays, you can ask me questions here during our open Q and A online, or you can obviously send me back um, questions and emails on the phone and on email, because remember, I do not text. I don't have yet to get a smartphone. So many ways to get a hold of me. Now, is there any other, any other topics there you want to cover about the golf ball possible rollback by 2028? or the beautiful feel of down through as opposed to under. No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. And I want to show you something else here today. You know, it's, um, most of you know that I call my things golf success, you know, because I've, I've learned that those, those two words are not an oxymoron over the years. And most of us, the first time I say golf success to someone, they always kind of you know, do a little double take. You say, what'd you say? You know, what do you mean golf success? I don't, I don't know what that means. You know, I've never seen that. So, so I started calling my things golf success about 25, 30 years ago, partly because one of the themes of all my teaching is I want you to not just learn what you're doing wrong. Believe me, you're doing a million things wrong, just like all of us. But I also want you to be learning to do what's right or learning what you're doing that is correct. What are you doing right? What are you doing correctly? So, um, one of the great things about that mindset is if you're going to really want to see golf success, you're going to have one, want to say, well, what, what is golf success? I have all kinds of stories where I can tell you many of you guys have and girls have experienced this already with me. When I've asked you what's golf success for a shot, you really don't have an answer. And yet some of y'all are building jet engines here at GE aircraft engines to keep the president airborne every day for the last hundred years or whatever it's been since Orville and Wilbur did their thing just north of here in Dayton. So, and some of y'all are running PNG that are students of mine. Some of the smartest people in the world in Kroger, you guys are doing these amazingly, you know, genius things with marketing. Y'all are some of the smartest people in the world. And yet, you know, like our friend from New Hampshire here is describing, he, he's been playing golf a number of years. He didn't realize this was good and this was bad. Right. So, Intellectually, I want you to understand those answers. I want you to learn what you're doing right, not just what you're doing wrong. And so what I want to show you here, I'm going to stop my share here, and then I'm going to share it again so you can see this. I thought, how can I describe to people the beautiful golf success they're having? And so uh, I thought, gee, how can I do that? So I actually just came up with this a few minutes ago. This is uh, a golf success player who you can see when he first played in February this year, these were the scores he shot. He was averaging 53. And then he played a good number of nine hole rounds. When he plays 18, he divides it into two nine hole rounds. And look at this, the last few rounds he played here up in Michigan and on vacation with his family, he was averaging 45. 
So 53 at the start of this year per nine on average down to 45. And for the year, he averaged 46. So 53 down to 45 when I went to school, that's an eight shot improvement in nine holes. So that's a 16 shot improvement in, in his 18 hole score in one season. So this fella doesn't think golf success is an oxymoron in any way, shape or form now, does he? So I just figured this out. You know, one way we could describe that reality is to say that he has improved 50% this year. You know, because 106 down to 90 is 16 shots for 18 holes. Well, 16 shots out of 106 shots is not 50%, Joel. And I agree. But look at it this way. Let's describe the reality this way. 72 is usually par. Our friend was averaging 106. So he was averaging 34 strokes over par when he started his season in February. Well, now he's averaging 90. Instead of 106, he's, he's improved 16 shots in one season. And remember, he started at 34 strokes over par averaging. Well, now he's averaging 16 strokes over par. So I'm saying he improved, right, 50%. Now, isn't that cool? Correct. Isn't he a pretty happy dude, right? So I'm going to tell you, though, that I'm going to show you. I think I can bring this up for you. Yes, I can. Are you seeing now the three-row chart? Yes. Oh, good. Good. This is another player, and I will confess my sins to you. This is yours truly. So this player doesn't shoot. You see, in 2020, this player was averaging two and a half over par for nine holes. Relative to par, he was two and a half over par. So this guy is not shooting 106. He's more like shooting 77, isn't he, for 18 holes? Right. And, and so 77, well, good golly, he's not going to improve 16 shots, right, in a year. If he was, right, he would be the one of the tour players that lives in Ohio, right? So another way to describe this reality is to say, well, from 20 to 21, he improved apparently eight tenths of a shot per nine holes. So eight tenths out of 2.5 is 33%, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So this player improved 33% in one year. So I like describing it that way, that it's not just how many strokes you're shaving, but the way I'm describing the reality right here is I'm saying, well, what percentage have, has your game really improved recently? And then this player, the next year, you notice, went down 14 one hundredths of a shot. So out of 1.72, right, 14 would be about 8 or 9%. Aren't I correct? Yes. Good, good math students. All right, people over about age 50, right? We, we can still do this math in our head. So, yes. um, so this player improved, what was it? 33% here then they improved about eight percent so that's 41 percent in two years starting from this baseline and then this player this year averaged point um seven four over par holy mackerel so this player averaging 0.74 he hasn't done his 23 year end golf mirror yet but he averaged 0.73 over par this year. So he improved 50%, holy mackerel, over the previous year. And 0.74 strokes over par for nine holes compared to 2.5, that's like 72% improvement in four years. So golf success, I'm convinced, is not, or maybe for some of us, it is still an oxymoron but I really don't want it to be an oxymoron for you if you're a friend of mine. So uh, this is just a good example to me of how I can describe the reality in some outside the box, kind of hippie. I tell people I'm kind of a leftover hippie. Again, like I said, they always told me when I was young, if I kept my hair long, I would lose it. And they were correct. So 
um, <laughs> you know, kind of George Carlin like ways of looking at our reality here in golf. Okay. So any questions about those numbers that I just showed you about how you can have golf success? None, none for me. I got it. Sweet. I'm very happy about that. So now I'm going to stop my screen share. And uh, the other quick topic I'll mention, and then I'll stay on as long as y'all want with any other questions, is um, I'll tell you, uh, since most of the people that come to me for lessons are pretty accomplished folks uh, of all ages, little kids even are a little pretty accomplished when they come to me in their little field of endeavor there at school or in their soccer game or tennis game or whatever, and now they're doing golf. Um, and like I mentioned, many of you are, you know, very accomplished in your fields, in your careers, you own your own business, or you're an executive in one of the other big corporations here in our tri-state area. Uh, but what I've, so most of y'all understand the difference between an employee and an independent contractor. And when I was a kid, and y'all were kids 40 years ago, if you're as old as me, we, Jack Nicholas would always say, when they asked him why he didn't play in the East Poughkeepsie Ace Hardware Charmin Toilet Paper Fall Classic in Poughkeepsie, he would say, well, I promised Barbara I would only stay away no more than two weeks at a time, and, and I'm an independent contractor. I can play golf whenever I want to. I don't, nobody, and yet, in our lifetimes over the last 40 years, since Jack and Arnie and Gary and Lee were making those statements, the PGA Tour has slowly brainwashed the players into thinking those players are employees. Oh. And so now they say Live Golf is taking our players. They seem to think at Ponte Vedra Beach, where I used to live down there in Jacksonville area, and I taught some of these executives when I lived down there, who are still a couple of them are still there. They say they are our they are our players. They don't call them employees because they know they're wrong in their professional mind. But I would just counsel you to think about this whole live thing again. I understand if it's moral for some people. I fully understand that there are murderers in every country, and so I fully understand that if your relatives have been murdered by people from certain countries, I understand your gripe. I understand your serious, very, can't be any more important beef. But when it comes to the professional business side of it and the athletic side and the entertainment side of it and the financial side of it, I would say the tour players on paper, PJ tour players are still supposedly independent contractors. And what I've seen over my lifetime, and again, I know some of these guys who've done it over the years, the PGA Tour, I tell people, can pretty much tell you the sun would rise in the West tomorrow and assure you that everything's still going to be fine. That They are the best spin doctors anywhere on the planet, better than D.C. even. And so that's just a little take on the uh, live, the whole overarching principle that is never getting reported, hardly ever. I've seen it reported three or four times in the last two years. This concept of independent contractor versus employee so any questions about that without getting into something no but i have a comment yeah go ahead well you know i've been self-employed my whole life and i think when i saw the live golf come about i was super happy because i there's nothing better than competition yes and i don't think there's ever i don't think the pga has had any competition right and 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 of course they recoiled the way they did. I understand that uh, they had to, you know, they were just shook up. And but but it's all kind of settled down. I just think the biggest mistake some of the players made, you know, is when they started to choose sides. And because to your point, I don't hear it. But think of it from the players' perspective. If the PGA is all there was, and if you want to make big money you got to play in their tournaments, then it's pretty easy to think like, well, I work for the PGA. I mean, I you know, because you're not going to make any money doing the Poughkeepsie Charmin Open 
and walk away with a, a new set of golf clubs and two boxes of Pro V ones. All right, you know, so so I can I guess what I'm trying to say from the player standpoint, I can see how easy it was for them to get brainwashed because the PGA could just say very, you know, when there's no recorders around, like you either play for us or you don't get anything. Right. You know, go go play the Charmin Open. You know. So so yeah. I I'm all for the live golf thing. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I think it's, it's been a monopoly. Fun. It's been a monopoly, but they've never surely called it that. No. And all the rules makers in D.C. have been right along with them, giving them special treatment. The the tour players have had a pension plan. Here's one more more specific example. I'll tell you of how brainwashed and how good the PGA Tour is of brainwashing all of society. The PGA Tour players have had a pension plan for decades. I didn't more, know that. The more cuts they make, the more money they win, the more tournaments they win, more money gets to their back pocket. And when the PGA of America members, the regular schmucks like me, have said, let's have a pension plan. Every guy at the front of the room always says back to us, we're a nonprofit, so we can have none of our money go directly to our members in our nonprofit. Well, for huh. decades, guys like me have said, well, the PGA Tour is nonprofit also. Don't tell the executives that who get paid the highest bucks in the whole golf industry, but it's nonprofit. But they have a pension plan because, again, there are carve outs that the D.C. rule makers have made right. for the people they want to make their friends. So so um, so now guess what's happening? The PGA of America is figuring out some ways because more and more guys like me are complain about this so the whole pj tour infrastructure down there the executives uh you want to take everything they say and then go check it somewhere else right yeah, so well, yeah it's beautiful competition but, in my way of thinking yeah yeah it is and then one more talk that i'd like to mention to you is that oh yeah this weekend and then we'll be done in about five minutes and uh this weekend down in naples florida like i said the men tour players are playing with the lady tour players and uh the two 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 person teams and one day it'll be a scramble another day it'll be kind of a funny kind of an alternate shot and then the other day they kind of play their own ball but they also switch drives so it'll be kind of cool because it'll be different formats you'll see how the scores really come out differently um you'll learn a lot about how the different formats affect the scores. And that can teach you a lot about your game, why certain holes or certain shots or certain clubs help you score better or score worse. Like here for 15 seasons, uh, you know, many of y'all have played in my winter and fall learning leagues. And it's become pretty obvious when y'all play scrambles, y'all average 20 shots lower as a team for 18 holes than when you play alternate shots. So I have 15 seasons of this. This is one season. So I have 15 seasons like this. So so now, as guys have seen that, again, they see golf success being uh, accomplished right in front of your eyes. Many of you have really enjoyed that. And it's helped you learn to temper your expectations when you're playing a scramble or you're playing alternate shot or you're playing some kind of a mixed uh, alternate shot. So enjoy that this weekend. Uh, when you see the ladies play with the men, because it's been about 15 years, no, maybe 25 years, I think, since they used to have that old J.C. Penney mixed team classic down in Orlando. And in 1961, I'll tell you this story. Um, many of you know about my famous aunt, and she was one of the ladies Hall of Famers, and she knew a lot of people in Cincinnati because McGregor made their clubs here in the Cincinnati-Dayton area for several decades. And so Ben Hogan, Mike Suchak, Tony Penna, Byron Nelson, Jack Nicklaus, Ben Crenshaw, all these players who used McGregor over the years would often come to Cincinnati to the factory to get their clubs made or adjusted. And so my aunt was one of those famous players. And so she knew a lot of people here in Cincinnati. And she always maintained that the, the, lady, the best lady players were just as good as the best men players um, if you took power out of the game. And so she kind of would have that friendly conversation with, because she played with a lot of them growing up on grandpa's golf course, you know, my grandpa's golf course, her daddy's golf course. 
with my dad, the two of them growing up, she caddied and played with the boys. And, you know, so she'd been against men her whole life, beating them. And so finally in 1961 at the Palm Beach par three course, uh, some of you have heard this story. Uh, so you could tell it also, but they got together the 12 best lady amateurs in the nation, the 12 best men amateurs in the nation, the 12 best lady pros in America, and the 12 best men pros in America in 1961 at the Palm Beach Par 3 golf course. And I'm pretty sure it's an 18-hole course. And they played because the ladies thought if we take power out of the game, we're just as good as the men. I'm pretty sure in 1961, it was three rounds, three 18-hole rounds, and my aunt won. She was really in the height of her career there. She started winning national tournaments in about 1947. And so by 61, she really was in mid-career form. She was doing fine. And so she won. And the story is told by more people than just my aunt. I've had other people tell me this story who were there personally. Sneed was so mad. Sam Sneed was so mad that he finished third. <laughs> that he, he came in grousing to my aunt about something, about some excuse about why he didn't win. And my aunt, like I said, had been playing with the boys her whole life. She had no trouble, you know, saying what was on her mind in a tactful, honest way to people. She said, Sam, I don't know what you're griping at me so much about. You didn't even finish second. <laughs> and the story is told that he went out into that seashell parking lot and spun his tires so fast and anger out of there man the shells were flying everywhere through that palm beach par three parking lot so so she loved that of course and the next year they wanted to do the event again and she said that's fine but i'm not coming she said i'm taking my ball and going home i, I beat you all i got my money and my trophy i'm i'm staying home i'm, I'm taking my ball and going home it turned out the only man that came was Sam Sneed. He won. Mickey Wright finished second, who was the other main dominant player in about 1960, 61, 62, like my aunt. The two of them finished like first and second and something like eight out of the 12 majors for about three years there. And so Mickey Wright was about to win, but Sam Sneed played well the last day and won. So that event actually was recorded and apparently was administered by the LPGA. So to this date, Sam Snead not only has more wins than any other mentor player, except for Tiger now, Tiger finally tied him, I think. Snead also has the most wins of any man on the LPGA tour. <laughs> so there you have it, folks. So watch the That's men and the ladies this weekend, hopefully have a lot of fun. And uh, watch them play together and realize that all those people you're seeing on TV, probably only about of the 40 players, I bet you I'd be surprised if two of them knew that story. But uh, wow. but uh, so it's pretty funny. So the, I've been all right. That's a great story, man. I've been I've that's been a beating my girl my whole life. My aunt, I never got a penny off my aunt all the times we played together. So I know it's <laughs> like get beat by a girl. I don't I don't mind a bit. I don't have any prejudice toward the women. Not at all. Just those three okay, things. Man. Enjoy the enjoy the weekend with the men and the ladies. Appreciate that the live uh, story. What's the conversation they call it nowadays? When they say a story. I don't know. The live, you know, the whole story of a like a news item. Oh well. But that whole story is kind of tainted by what you've been hearing from the tour for the last 40 or 50 years. And then realize golf success is not an oxymoron. You can have golf right. success. Like our friend today talked about, he got something clear intellectually in his mind. He understood it intellectually. Now he's able to do it much better physically. Yep. Thanks so, yeah. so much, Good job. Guys. We'll see you soon. Good job. See you next Wednesday if you like. Take care.